In Lucky's tonight, Vauxhall's new European... Hello. First tonight, the new boss of General Motors in Europe has been speaking about his plans for the business. The fate of tens of thousands of employees lies in Nick Riley's hands, including 1,400 workers at Vauxhall's van factory in Luton. Mr Riley was speaking to the media at the RAC club in London. Our reporter Mike Cartwright is there now. Mike. Yes, GM's new boss in Europe today met Lord Mandelson, the business secretary. He met uh, Tony Woodley, the joint leader of the Union Unite. And a few moments ago, he met us and other media here at the Royal Automo Automobile Club. Now, we'll play you his interview in a second. But first of all, let's just take a look at the job he now faces. Mick Riley's role is only temporary, but it will be key in restructuring Vauxhall and Opel's future. He knows Luton well. He was in charge of the Vauxhall plant when it shut in 2000. These the angry scenes when workers stormed the company headquarters. At its height, Vauxhall employed around 10,000 workers in the town. These days, its sister company, IBC, employs just over 1,400. Meanwhile, at Ellesmere Port in Merseyside, Vauxhall has more than 2,000 workers. Nick Riley now holds in the balance their future, along with 55,000 Opel workers across Europe. Half of those are in Germany. At this car plant near Dortmund, workers want guarantees they won't be closed down. This factory here in Bochum, if that was uh, closed... The image from GM, uh, Opel, it's uh, stark, stark, strong, strong damaged. Yes. And that uh, it's not possible for GM to close this factory. Mr. Riley's appointment comes after General Motors pulled out of the takeover deal with Magna, the Canadian car company. Under their plans, IBC and Luton would have lost around 300 workers. Under GM, unions fear redundancies will be similar. But for the long-term future of the van plant, its new boss will have to secure two things. Financial backing from the government and a new van to build after 2013. Well, GM say they pulled out of the takeover deal with Magna because of what they call an improving business environment. Well, bearing that in mind, I began by asking Nick Riley, does that mean Luton is now safe? For Luton, we have a contract that runs through 2013 for building cars, uh, vans for both Renault and ourselves, um, and we're going to continue that contract. Um, and then, after that, we either... Uh, build the next generation of that vehicle, depending on our negotiations with Renault. And if not, then we need to find a, another product for the plant. Well, you met Lord Mandelson today. I mean, how did you reassure him that GM are committed to Luton? Uh, it wasn't that difficult to convince, um, to convince Lord Mandelson, actually. Uh, he uh, expressed to me that he was actually pleased with the decision that GM had decided to keep Opel and Vauxhall in the GM family. He has considerably more confidence in the plan that, that we've got uh, than the other plan that was being developed. And as, I've, as I explained to him and, and to others, it was never GM's intention or desire uh, to sell off a, a Vauxhall. Under the Magna deal, it's thought around 300 jobs would go at Luton. How many jobs will now go under GM? Really, I, I can't give details today. The reason for that is this is not just a UK issue. Uh, our restructuring plan covers the whole of Europe, and it would not be right for me uh, to give the details of that restructuring plan here so that people in Spain hear about their jobs from UK media. I am willing to say, though, that um, uh, I, I think there's good opportunity for the UK to, to carry on with um, strong manufacturing presence from, from General Motors. So for Luton, it all really depends on getting another van beyond 2013 for it to survive? Yeah, we need another product, and uh, uh, we're, we're, I'm already starting to work on the, on the possibilities for that. Nick Riley, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Well, as you heard from that in interview, what we didn't really get is the nitty-gritty of GM's plan. That should come out over the next three weeks, but really what it comes down to is just um, Luton getting a new van contract after 2013. Back to the studio. Mike, thank you. A soldier from Cambridgeshire who was serving with the Territorial Army has been shot dead two weeks after arriving af in Afghanistan. Rifleman Andrew Fentiman had told friends troops were waiting for promised new body armour and helmets. Amelia Reynolds is in our newsroom. 
Angie Fentiman is the 11th soldier from this region to be killed in Afghanistan this year. He was 23 and worked as a sales manager for the software firm Team Studio based in Huntingdon. But as a TA soldier, he put that career on hold to deploy to Afghanistan as part of 7th Battalion, the Rifles, and he died after coming under fire while on foot patrol in Helmand province on Sunday. How did he make those comments about the helmets and the body armour? He wrote an internet blog to let friends know that he'd arrived in Afghanistan and there's one paragraph that's particularly interesting here. It reads, we are still waiting on these new body armour and helmets that were promised to us. You would have seen the story splashed all over the news. They said they would be ready for us but we hope they will arrive soon. Now this was the reaction of the MOD. I just want to make it very clear that uh, the Osprey and the Osprey Assault body arms, the two body armors we are talking about, offer exactly the same uh, amount of protection and also have the same coverage of protection. Um, so actually, whichever body armor he was wearing, from a protection point of view, it made no difference. First TA soldier from this region to be killed in Afghanistan. He is, and this region has the highest number of reservists in Afghanistan. Out of 500 out there, 100 are from this region. And, and of course, they're expected to carry out the same duties as, as regular soldiers. They're trained to the same standards. The only difference is, is that these people have volunteered to go to Afghanistan. No TA soldier is, is made to go to war. And that's something that Andrew Fentiman's commanding officer alludes to in his tribute. He says it was a great act of commitment that he chose to accompany us and share the burden. Now, finally, in the last few minutes, the soldier from Carver Barracks at Wimbish near Saffron Walden, who was killed in an explosion, has been named as Corporal Lauren Christopher Marlton Thomas from 33 Engineer Regiment. Amelia, thank you very much. The Conservative Party says it's going to change the way it chooses candidates following the Elizabeth Truss row. Party members in South West Norfolk voted overwhelmingly last night not to deselect her. There's some flash photography in this report from our political correspondent Andrew Sinclair. A lot more relaxed. For the last three weeks, she's avoided the cameras. Today, Elizabeth Truss was happy to be seen out and about in the constituency. This whole row centred on an affair that she had five years ago, which was widely reported at the time. And for the last three weeks, she's had to endure it all being reported again. Well, of course, there's an element of hurtfulness, but I accept, and I think all politicians have to accept, that when you put yourself in the spotlight, you put yourself under a certain degree of scrutiny, and you do have to answer questions. I accept that. On reflection, do you think you could have handled things better? Well, I mean, I, I did an interview before where I said that I had been sorry about the way things came out. But I think now that I've got the full endorsement of the local association, that we're ready to move forward and we're ready to make a positive campaign. Elizabeth Truss is our prospective candidate. After three weeks of controversy and name-calling, the Conservative Party was finally uniting behind its candidate last night. It's very happy indeed. Very good. Common sense prevailed. But not everyone. I'm not proud to be a Conservative just at this given moment. Because the man who led the calls for Ms Trust to go still feels that the local party has been hoodwinked into accepting an A-list candidate. Conservative central office deceived us deceived. and they have betrayed us. This row struck a chord with many Conservative associations who feel that central office is interfering too much in the selection process. In Suffolk Central, for instance, there's anger that the shortlist of candidates contains no one local. It's worked out fine here, but we mustn't have local associations feeding this sense of resentment and frustration across the country. During last night's meeting, a letter was read out from the Conservative Deputy Chairman John Maples. He acknowledged mistakes had been made. Candidate selection would be different in the future, he said. The turnip Taliban, as they became known, may not have unseated Elizabeth Truss, but they made their point, and the Conservative leadership has noticed. Andrew Sinclair, BBC Look East in South West Norfolk. Well, Jonathan Isabey writes for the website Conservative Home, which has close links with Tory activists. When I spoke to him earlier, he said the row in Norfolk has shown that party members...